Good morning, Church Fernow. It's uh, nice to be with you in another one of our online services. Uh, today is the 23rd of October, Labor Weekend, which is the last public holiday of the year, the long weekend. Uh, and so uh, I hope that you are enjoying it. I hope that you've had some, some rest, some downtime, uh, maybe some adventure as well. I uh, hope that the kids are not, not too bored as well, uh, but enjoy it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm praying right now, it's Thursday, I'm praying that the weather is good for the weekend. Uh, so yes, Lord. <laughs> hey, um, I hope you're enjoying the new auditorium look. Uh, I think it looks pretty remarkable. Um, it's completely changed the, uh, the look of the place, hasn't it? So um, we've been very grateful for your patience, but also grateful for the, all the efforts that have gone into, into making it what it is. So um, yeah, it, it's very, very cool. Um, next Sunday, the 30th of October, is our baptism service. So at the moment, we've got two people who are getting baptized, which is awesome. So it'd be great to see as many people as possible come and support those people. And if you're thinking now that, you know, baptism is something you'd like to talk more about, or you feel like you're ready to, to take that plunge, to take that next step in your journey with Jesus, then um, please, please, please talk to myself or James or someone else in the church. And it would be great uh, if we could, um, yeah, maybe make that happen uh, next week or another time. Uh, we'd love to chat with you through that. Now, before we get into the today's service, um, I was thinking, what do I want to share today? Um, I want to share a very well-known Psalm, Psalm 23. Uh, I know most of you will probably know it, and it's one of my favorites, um, and it's often, it's often uh, sung at uh, funeral services or celebration services, and it's a special, special psalm. But as I read it today, I want to encourage you to read it with me and to pray it to the Lord as we pray together. So I'm going to substitute the, um, the my and, and me to, for our and us. So. Um, Feel free to read along. The words are going to be on the screen. And let's pray this to, to God this morning. The Lord is our shepherd. We have all that we need. He lets us rest in green meadows. He leads us beside peaceful streams. He renews our strength. He guides us along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when we walk through the darkest valley, we will not be afraid, for you are close beside us. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort us. You prepare a feast for us in the presence of our enemies. You honor us by anointing our heads with oil. Our cup overflows with blessing. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue us all the days of our lives, and we will live in the house of the Lord forever. How good is that, isn't it? I mean, not, not just that God is with us now and he is our shepherd right now and he knows exactly what, what we need because that's what a shepherd knows about, about his sheep, but that he protects us, he prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. So no matter what we're facing, he's right there with us preparing that table for us. And then he says, we will live in the house of the Lord forever. And that is a promise that we can take with us today and to this week and for all of our lives. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you that you are the good shepherd who laid down your life for us. Thank you that we can come to know you and have a personal relationship with you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you come and live with us. You come and dwell with us. And you give us the strength and the power and the counsel that we need in our lives. Lord, today we commit ourselves to you. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. We ask that you would be near to us and close to us and to our loved ones. And we give you all the glory and we thank you that we will live in the house of the Lord forever with each other and with you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Great Shepherd, Jesus, together. Thank you. 
Well, good morning, church family, and welcome back to another one of our online Sundays. You will notice from my surroundings this week that I'm back in the church, and that's because the painting has now all been completed. And this week, the carpenters will be coming in, which means that by next week, Sunday, all the carpets will be done, the painting will be done, and there's just a few little bits and pieces to sort out. But otherwise, things are looking nice and fresh and new. If you haven't come down to see it yet, you should pop down and come and have a look at the changes that have taken place. For today, we carry on in our series through the book of 1 Thessalonians. And this was a, a young church. Uh, this was a letter that Paul had written to them to encourage them in their faith. If I was to ask you about the Apostle Paul and what your impressions of him are from your reading of Scripture, I wonder what sort of thoughts might come to mind. He was bold. Uh, he was courageous. He could be a little bit tetchy at times. Uh, sometimes he could be really forceful about making a point. But with that, he was also quite soft. He was caring. He was pastoral. And that pastoral aspect of who he was really comes out to the fore in the text that we're going to read today. Now, it's a slightly longer text, but that's okay. Let's jump right into it, and you'll find that in 1 Thessalonians, we'll be reading in chapter 2 and from verse 17. So let's read together. But brothers and sisters, when we were... When we were orphaned by being separated you, from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted, and it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason... When I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you, and that our labors might have been in vain. But Timothy has just now come to us from you, and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us, and that you long to see us, just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live, since you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Paul had longed to see this church, and in fact, the way Paul writes it here, it says that it was an intense longing. And I wonder, have you ever longed intensely for someone? That when you were separated, you counted the, the years, months, weeks, days, hours, and minutes until you could see them again. There was a couple in our previous church, and when they were younger, he was in the Navy, and one of his things in the Navy was that he was on a submarine. And she told us that he would be gone for weeks or months, and they were not told when they would return. You know, military secrecy stuff and whatever else which meant that there was this longing, but not a date where this longing could finally come to a conclusion. And that's what Paul was having here, that he wanted to go and see this church, but he couldn't quite get there for reasons which we'll look at in just a few moments. You see, the way always seemed to have been blocked, and the reason that he gives, not an excuse, but the reason for him not going is an interesting one. He doesn't use, say that look, he's, he's, he's busy. He hasn't said, look, I'd love to come and see you as sort of a, a placeholder thing that he never intends to really try and live out. He says that Satan had prevented him from going, that Satan had blocked his way. 
Which makes me wonder how well Paul was known in the underworld, that Satan is being attributed with blocking his path. You, it, it, sometimes it can be hard to be known. You may know, church family, that one of the coffee shops that I frequent is the coffee club. And it's not that I have an emotional attachment to the coffee club as an organization. It's that I am a VIP there, which I know is amazing. As a result, I have a VIP card. And with that VIP card, I can go into coffee club on any day of the year that it's open and buy a hot drink and get another hot drink free. That's right. Every day of the year they're open. Buy one, get one free. Now that changes at the end of the month, which means I'll probably go and find a new coffee shop. But nonetheless, I've been going to coffee club for a number of years now, and that's just where I go. So much so that I feel like I might be known in the coffee club. One On one occasion, Brina and I were going, and I, I realized I'd left my, my VIP card at home. And so I went in to, to tell them, look, I've left my VIP card at home, but you know me, you know this face. And so could you just give me my buy one, get one free anyway? And they looked at me, and when I made the request, they looked at me and they said no. So after all these years of going in there, they still wouldn't let me have it without my VIP card. So we went off to Starbucks instead on that particular occasion. So for Paul, though, it seems that he was known in the underworld because Satan was blocking his path. Now, Satan, as we well know, is not God. Far from it. He is already defeated. Jesus did that on the cross. So Satan not being God means he doesn't have God attributes. So one of the things that he cannot be is omnipresent. And so if he was giving his attention to Paul, that would be quite a big deal. I wonder if you know the story of the seven sons of Sceva. It's a story which is found in the book of Acts, it's found in chapter 19, and it is a, a strange combination of a story uh, between quite scary and at the same time has a little bit of humor in it. Now I could tell you the story, but instead of me telling you the story, I'm going to let Luke tell you the story in his own words. He writes it like this. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. And so you have this moment. You can imagine them you know, going in trying to do their, their thing. And, the, and the, the man says, looks at them and says, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? They must have known at that point things weren't going to go quite so well. But it seems that Paul had come to their attention, that he in fact was known. And then I began to wonder, I wonder if we are known. I hope we are. But I don't think Paul thought Satan himself was the one who was actually doing it, but rather he's got the minions doing it on his behalf. Once a term, we provide a college down at Long Bay College for the staff down there. And in order to provide the, the morning tea that we do down there, what we do is uh, we ask the church to bake and bring in goodies, and the church does. And they do it wonderfully well. They, they bake delicious goodies, they bring in delicious goodies, and that gets brought to the church office. From the church office, Matt, Anya, Jackson, and oftentimes Nikki will take it all down to the college, and they'll get it all set up before morning tea, uh, the morning tea bell has run, rung. And then, they, at, at the end, once all the morning teas have been served, they will make sure everything gets cleaned up and packed away. Now, I'm part of this day as well. And my role in this particular day is after they've done all the work, packing it, uh, setting it up, I arrive. And before they do all the hard work of packing it all away again, I leave. So I go down for the morning tea and chat to a few people while I'm there. And invariably, while I'm there, someone says to me, thank you for doing this. Now, we all know it wasn't me that did it. And yet they look at me as they, they offer the thanks. And of course, I'm very humble and gracious. And I normally say something like, yes, yes, it was, it was all me. No, I'm just kidding, of course. So in this, in this instance, I think this is the way that Paul is talking, that it's being attributed to Satan. And whether it's Satan himself or not, or, or, or one of his underlings, whichever it was, 
we recognize that, that we are in a spiritual battle. It's a reminder that our battle is not against, as we're told in other places of Scripture, it's not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. And we recognize that we have an adversary, and his name is Satan, and he does not have our best interests at heart. In 1 Peter 5, it's described like this. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. In another place, he's called the accuser. In another, the tempter. Another, a deceiver. His very name means adversary or one who opposes. Another of his titles, devil, means slanderer. These are not good words, but they do describe our enemy. People are not our enemy. Satan is. In order to battle, we need to be A, on the right battlefield, and then we need to battle with the right equipment. I suppose you've heard that phrase, never take a, a knife to a gunfight. And so here we are in this spiritual battle, and how do we undertake, what weapons do we have to work with in this spiritual battle? Now, I'm only going to talk about one here this morning. This will be a whole sermon series, I guess. But if I was to ask a hundred people, and I haven't, but play along with me just for a moment, if I was to ask a hundred people what spiritual weapons we've got, what would you imagine the top answer would be? You see, I've got nothing new on this. There's no special formula. There's no special location, no amount of money. But the answer would still remain exactly the same. I would imagine that the top answer that we've got to engage in the spiritual battle is prayer. We have our Father in heaven who listens to our prayers, who answers our prayers. When Jesus told, was teaching his disciples to pray, he said, when you pray. The expectation obviously being that we would, in fact, pray. But he says that when you do, pray in this way. And he starts with the, these two words, our Father. The first thing that we remember when we come to prayer is we're praying to our Father who is in heaven. It's not a distant relative. It's not a friend of a friend. It is our Father. It reminds us of whose family we are in. Then in prayer, something miraculous happens. Our Father in heaven lets our prayers impact this world. And so we pray for others. We pray for those we know. We pray for those we don't know. We pray for those who can pray for themselves. We pray for those who can't pray for themselves. We pray for those that don't know how to pray for themselves. And that's why I'm so grateful. We've got on a Tuesday night a prayer meeting which happens down here at church. And it's a band of faithful prayers who pray every Tuesday night. They have some information which is sent into them. They have their own information which they, they will bring along. And they pray every week faithfully for a myriad of things in this local church, in this local area, and <clears throat> around the world. And as they do, it allows things to happen, to take place, that otherwise might lack the impact we would desire. I'm grateful for our small groups that gather each week, and as they do, they pray for one another and others. And as they pray, things change. Prayer is an individual sport, but it is also a team sport. And it is a significant way that we engage in this spiritual battle that we are in. But still, there will be obstacles and they do come. And one significant obstacle for this early church was that of persecution. But the way that Paul views it is interesting. He says that um, he encourages them not to be unsettled by these trials. And then he goes on to say, for you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that, that, you would, that we would be persecuted. And so these obstacles come. I told you it would happen, says Paul. And it's not a reason to withdraw. It's not a reason to stop. Because as we heard last week, it hasn't changed the truth of the matter of who Jesus is and what he did and the implications for us and for this world from now and into eternity. So we're not defeated by these obstacles. When I was coaching netball, one of the things that we would do was I've got these two kilogram sort of medicine balls and we would throw them around for a little while and the girls would get used to throwing these heavy balls around and then we would put them to one side, we'd walk onto the court and then we'd start to throw the netball around. Now the netball is a much lighter ball and having dealt with the more difficult ones, they could ping them around the court with ease. They would smile and they'd, they'd realize how light and how easy it was. 
And that's what it's like for us when we overcome these obstacles. They make us stronger to do what we are called to do. So that when we come up with, with other things, we think, wow, this isn't quite as difficult as I thought. Or our faith has been grown and, and matured in a way that when an, when an obstacle comes up, when there is an area which might require faith, we think we've got a resource to tap into. We have been in this situation before. So then, Paul, he knows what's at stake. And so he has this desire to see this church, this church which is undergoing this persecution and he wants them to stand strong and he desperately wanted to see them so desperate that he uses um, words that are, are full of emotion they are strong words he says that being apart from them was like being orphaned and it, it just gives us an idea of how much Paul actually wanted to be back at this church to encourage them to teach them to stand alongside them as they face persecution and I wonder if you've ever felt that about someone that you think I just want to be with them because the things that they're going through are just so tough I want to sit alongside them I might not be able to change the situation around but they would know that I've got their back that I'm, I'm there with them even in the midst of the trial that they are facing often a husband or wife might feel that for the other I know that when I went away to college, each week I would go away and did that for three years. And every time I was away, we would phone up and we would pray together over the phone each night. Just knowing that, that what Verena was, was dealing with at home, what I was dealing with at college, we were there with one another in all of that. We would do it for our children. We'd be fierce for them, protecting them. I know in, in, in some instances you think, well, you know, if they were attacked by a bear and you think, well, I would tackle that bear. We don't have bears in our location, but we do have stresses and pressures which they come under. And what we wouldn't do to be with them in the midst of those stresses and those pressures. And that's what Paul was doing here. The only difference was he wasn't talking about this in a biological sense. Now, absolutely, we'd feel that for our family, but he wasn't talking about a, a biological family. He wasn't saying, I'm going to do this only for someone that I've chosen to spend the rest of my life with. I'm not going to do this for people that carry the same genes as what I've got. He was talking about this um, for his local or for this local church. The strong, emotive, emotional language being used at, for a local church. This local church that he preached at for three consecutive Sabbaths a little while ago. And I wonder... I wonder how you feel about your local church. Uh, do you feel, as Paul felt, that when we couldn't gather, that it was like being orphaned, that we couldn't be with our church family? It's a challenge, I think, for us all with how we view our local church and our relationship with our local church. As we gather together, we're called to love one another. Paul wrote this letter from Corinth, and before... Uh, that he had a little bit of a bad run, if we're honest. He had to leave Thessalonica quickly, and then after that he got chased out of Berea, was sneered at in Athens, and then was abused in Corinth. So he was facing persecution. He had had this bad run of things, and yet his concern is for this church, so much concern that he wanted Timothy to go back to this church. And when Timothy goes, it's going to leave Paul all alone. Timothy, his right-hand man, Timothy, the one that's providing encouragement. And yet Paul looks around and he thinks, what's the best thing that I can do for this local church? And in this sense, and it's a very downscaled version of this, I accept that. In this sense, I guess he was doing what God does for us. He looked around and he thought, what's the best we can do for the people of this world? And he sent his son. Now, Timothy goes, and Timothy didn't go and die for this local church, of course. But Paul was looking around in the same way, in the same attitude, saying, what's the best I can offer? And then he offered Timothy to them. And as Timothy goes, Paul has to face all of these things alone. But he does it because he loves this local church. But Timothy goes with a purpose in mind. He goes to strengthen and encourage this local church. He goes. He comes back with a good report. In fact, Paul is gushing about this local church. He speaks of their faith and of their, of their love for God, of their fondness for Paul, and it's all outstanding. And you think, wow, if there was going to be a report about a local church, what would you want our report to be? And if we're going to consider our local church, the one that we are a part of here at Long Bay Baptist, what do you think 
we could we could put on our report card if we had to report about ourselves now it's not about bragging or anything like that remember it's not bragging if it's true but what are the things that we do really well now you can imagine we could we could create a, a list and and this church here had its own list standing firm under persecution loving god loving others um and, and doing this amazing thing and yet paul says that he would like to go in order to supply what was lacking in their faith the reality that this church this church that paul was gushing about still had some things that they needed to work on paul says he wants to go to supply what was lacking in their faith still an amazing church they're still doing amazing things still an incredibly faithful group of, of people and yet we know in chapter 4 he deals with morality questions in chapter 5 there are relational questions in chapters 4 and 5 there are theological questions pertaining to the second coming of Jesus so they had some things that they also had to work on and so a few moments ago I said if you're going to list all of our good points we might have created a list but if you're going to list a, a, a spend a few moments uh, writing a list of things that we need to work on our points for progress what would you put on that list now this could be any church every church could have a um, do this exercise that and and they might come up with slightly different things but the reality is there'd still be two lists there are things that we do well and there are areas that are points for progress for each one of us in some ways I guess we should leave our auditorium unfinished and leave it as a metaphor for us as a local church that we are a work in progress now I, I think we're going to finish the auditorium but nonetheless the metaphor would work we are a, a church we are a work in progress but then what if I was to make it a little bit more personal what if we were to look at us as individuals and think what are some of the things that I do well and then we write our second list what are some of the areas that are points for progress now don't sit there and say them out loud but you might want to find someone to say them out loud to a close friend a small group Matt or I one of the leadership council would all be happy to have a chat to to celebrate with you the things that that you you do really well and to look with you and and, and figure out as you've identified these points for progress what some good next steps might be but that would be my encouragement that even this church that Paul wrote about, that he, he wrote so glowingly about, we recognize for each one of us that we are on a journey towards and with Jesus. And I wonder, what are your next steps that you can take in your faith journey? Maybe one exercise is to write them down, share them with another, and then take your next step. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can gather here with you this morning. We thank you that as we can we, we pray, we come before you in the sense of acknowledging that you are our Father in heaven. We thank you that you call us to be sons and daughters of the God Most High. We pray for each one of us that we will live our li lives in such a way that we don't let our crowns slip. That we represent you very well to our family, to our friends, to our colleagues. That we, we engage with your Holy Spirit's work at this world, uh, work in this world in, in a wonderful way. We pray that we engage in the work of your Holy Spirit in our own lives. That little by little, day by day, week by week, month by month, we become more like our Saviour, Jesus. Let our love overflow for you. Let our love overflow for each other in this congregation. And let our love overflow for the people of this world whom you so dearly love. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our risen Saviour. Amen.